today we have um, a guest lecture by Professor Nelson. Professor Nelson is an associate professor in the Department of Planning and Urban Studies at the University of New Orleans, where she coordinates the Master of Urban and Regional Planning program. She teaches and conducts research in local economic development, community development, and urban revitalization. Professor Nelson's recent work on New Orleans addresses planning and conditions to deal with vacant and abandoned property. Her research is aimed at informing city officials on ways to translate the desire for a safe, better city into policies that could direct a just redevelopment. Her lecture today is Recovery and Resilience in Post-Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans, Lessons for Planning. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Nelson to Ball State and to the Department of Urban Planning. Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be here. As Michael said, uh, my background, um, I teach at the University of New Orleans. Most of my research focuses on uh, inclusive economic development and community revitalization. I uh, never really thought too much about hazards planning and uh, recovery work uh, until uh, Katrina hit uh, in New Orleans. And naturally, um, I turned part of my attention to Reco recovery planning and redevelopment in New Orleans. So I thought that today, um, based upon that work, I would offer a few thoughts on um, where we are as a city 10 years out uh, after the federal flood, talk about resilience as a concept uh, and what it offers planning uh, and offer some words for caution. Uh, and then talk about what we can learn from New Orleans and some lessons uh, for planning more broadly. But I thought what I would start with is uh, briefly talk a bit about Katrina's impact uh, and early responses to um, Katrina that really cemented uh, our recovery plan moving forward. What we have uh, here up on the screen, this is a slide of uh, flooding in the city of New Orleans, probably about two weeks after Katrina. Um, it was uh, you know, no doubt devastating. The failure of the levees wound up flooding 80% of the city. Uh, if you look up on the map, you can see a little bit of the gray area that remained dry. This is uh, referred to as a sliver by the river. This is a historic part of New Orleans on uh, historically high ground. Um, so 80% of the city flooded. Much of the city remained underwater for uh, six weeks or more. And in some places, uh, that water was as high as 15 feet. We had in New Orleans alone 100,000 housing units that were uh, severely damaged or destroyed, uh, making it the largest residential disaster in U.S. history. Um, Gulf Coast-wide, a million residents were displaced. And a month after Katrina, there were still 600,000 households that remained displaced. So in the city of New Orleans, uh, people who came back and came back quickly, uh, in many cases that quickly may have been one month, two months, uh, in some cases three months. Not only was our infrastructure and uh, housing stock destroyed, but the economy was devastated. And very early on after Katrina in the days and weeks and months afterwards, real questions about whether or not the city would come back uh, and if it should be uh, rebuilt. It's important, I think, when you uh, think about this post-Katrina context, have a little understanding about where New Orleans was before the storm. Um, you know, as I said, I, I didn't do uh, disaster recovery planning uh, before I moved to New Orleans and had to experience Katrina. And even afterwards, in my recovery work, um, I frame it uh, within the larger context of recovery within the context of, of longer-term decline. And I've often made the case in a lot of my work that in many cases, New Orleans has more in common with legacy cities like a Detroit or a Cleveland than in uh, a lot of its southern neighbors, like Houston or Atlanta. 
And uh, what this graphic shows here is uh, declining population and declining population density in the city. Um, when Katrina happened, the entire city was evacuated. Essentially, the population went down to zero. But it's important to realize that population had been falling and falling pretty rapidly uh, since the 1960s. Um, and at the same time, the footprint of the city was expanding. Uh, so in the post-war period in the 1960s, we started to uh, build uh, residential subdivisions in a part of New Orleans called New Orleans East. This was an area of the city uh, very vulnerable to house, uh, very vulnerable to floods. We built slab on grade housing. Um, and looking at it after Katrina, people said, that was crazy, how could you do it? But at the time when it was done, uh, this is when, um, you know, cities across the country were losing um, their residents to suburbs. This was an opportunity for the city of New Orleans to create these desirable middle class suburbs within the city. So population is declining, but the footprint uh, is, is expanding. Um, and when that happened, uh, we saw that our vacancy rates and vacant land really increased considerably. So before Katrina, we were one of the most blighted and, and vacant cities uh, in the country, really on par with places like a, a Flint, Michigan. Uh, Katrina would come and, and really exasperate these problems uh, that we had. So in the aftermath of Katrina, we had planners, redevelopment professionals, and commentators uh, from around the country who, uh, as is often done after a disaster, framing uh, the destruction of the city as this opportunity, an opportunity in rebuilding uh, to try to address these uh, long-term problems that the city had been facing. And for many, primarily people from outside of New Orleans, uh, and we were in, inundated with outside professionals who came to help, this uh, idea that New Orleans was a blank slate, right, that we could um, pretty easily make some major changes in uh, the built environment to make it more resilient. And what this meant is to shrink the footprint of the city. And by doing that, we could move people or prevent people from coming back to the most vulnerable parts of the city. Uh, and also, um, you know, after a disaster, there's a lot of resources, but there's never enough, right? So if we could channel development, con consolidate the city, we could target resources uh, to these consolidated areas uh, and help sustain city services for a smaller population. You know, as New Orleans was spread out and losing population, I mean, we had, before Katrina, terrible services. Um, you know, this was a way to uh, try to address this. And um, so what happened is a month after Katrina, less than a month after the floodwaters uh, had come in, we had the first of what would be three citywide recovery planning processes. So in planning school, we learn about you know, involving people uh, in the planning process. There were no people to involve, right, because uh, everyone was scattered across the country. And we had design professionals and planners, primarily affiliated with the Urban Land Institute, come in uh, and make some recommendations. And the first recommendation was to have a four-month moratorium and say, okay, no one can come back and rebuild until we figure out where it makes sense. And as part of this figuring out, there was to be a neighborhood planning process in which uh, residents and neighborhood organizations would be able to uh, prove their viability. Um, and, um, you know, this was, I think, a, a very rational reaction to the uncertainty of what was going to unfold. A recognition that we had uh, lost too many people before the storm and we had no idea of what to expect. Um, and a real concern that if we just let everyone come back, uh, redevelopment would be haphazard and we would uh, get a jack-o'-lantern effect is what it was referred to in New Orleans, so that we would have pockets of redevelopment uh, in seas of blight. So it made sense, but consolidation efforts, I think no matter uh, how logical from a, a land use management standpoint, you know, are politically, uh, socially, and organizationally difficult to uh, implement, and that was the case in New Orleans. Uh, and in New Orleans, uh, this vision that the planners had uh, was relayed to people on the front page of a, a, the 
Times Picayune, which was at that time our local newspaper, at a time when very few people were back in the city. Uh, and this is referred to as the infamous green dot map, showing the green dots presumably places that wouldn't be allowed uh, to rebuild. Um, and what the planners didn't consider uh, were the racial and class implications of what they were proposing. African American and low income neighborhoods were disproportionately impacted by the flooding. You know, it's funny, with 80% of the city that flooded, a lot of people have referred to it as an equal opportunity disaster. I mean, that's not the case. African American, low income, and, and elderly populations were disproportionately uh, affected by the flooding. Had a consolidation scheme gone through, these populations would have been uh, similarly affected. In, in the absence of any sort of resettlement plan to say, okay, we're going to consolidate, where are we going to put the people who are being consolidated? Uh, any notion of shrinking the footprint of the, the city became a euphemism for denying primarily African Americans uh, the right to return. Uh, and as uh, would be expected, um, this met a great deal of, of opposition uh, from residents across the city uh, who vehemently opposed this plan and the city backtracked uh, and said, okay, we're not going to even talk about consolidation any further uh, and we're going to uh, allow rebuilding through the city. Um, and what would happen, this green dot map and the reaction to a lot of these, uh, the early planning proposals, really galvanized resident engagement um, at a level that was pretty unprecedented in the city's history. So we had new organizations that were created, old organizations uh, that were reinvigorated to decide how we're going to move forward and plan. Uh, and this was everything from engaging in these formal planning processes, as we can see in the image below, um, to do-it-yourself urbanism, where uh, you know local organizations were stepping up and cleaning up their streets, opening up uh, the facilities in their neighborhood. And through this, uh, residents became not only very highly engaged in civic issues, but became really, really very knowledgeable about planning uh, and policy uh, issues. So I wanted to lay that out before I talked about where we are now, 10 years out. Uh, has the city recovered? How has it recovered? And getting at this issue of resilience. Uh, the city of New Orleans has now adopted resilience into its uh, tagline, Resilient New Orleans. Um, and I think before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by resilience. And the definition appears from the Oxford uh, Dictionary, which is essentially the ability to bounce back um, and to come back and make your way through uh, these tough or difficult situations. But oftentimes in planning, uh, we add to it you know, work that I think draws on uh, C.S. Hollings and his models of uh, evolutionary resilience that says, hey, it's not about just coming back to where we were, to the status quo, um, but a whole change or transformation in the system. So that resilience isn't about coming back, but it's about adaptation um, and um, building back in a, in a new way. And this was really very helpful, I think, initially, uh, this sort of construction and thinking through rebuilding and recovery in New Orleans, uh, because it allowed, it prompted a discussion, a real recognition about what was important to the city, what the city and its many populations valued, uh, and also a recognition of uh, the city's many long-standing uh, problems. And there was talk early on to say, hey, we're not going to just build we're going to build back better. The problem is what better meant, <laughs> you know, it meant something different to uh, every different uh, stakeholder involved. So a little bit about uh, where we're at. Um, you know, our recovery has, has come back quite strong. Uh, with the 2010 census, we were at about 75% of our pre-Katrina population. And this is much uh, further than many people expected and uh, was definitely um, thought of as a, as a testament to the city's resilience and commitment to the city. 
More recently, data show uh, that if you look at the number of households that are receiving mail, we're at uh, the 90% of, of pre-Katrina levels. So this is coming back pretty strong. Uh, and our economic recovery has uh, likewise been strong. We've recovered nearly all of our pre-Katrina um, peak. Uh, we've reached our pre-Katrina um, peak job numbers. And our economy, relative to a lot of other places, shows continued sign of strength. But here's, I think, when we talk about resilience and this sort of adaptation to something new, we can really see it with what uh, officials have tried to do uh, with the recovery of our economy. There's been a real focus on diversifying the economy. New Orleans, as I said, had, pretty, uh, had been a pretty stagnant place economically. Uh, all of our jobs were focused on oil and gas, the port, uh, and low-wage tourism jobs. And there's been a real effort to say, how can we diversify the economy, um, increase the amount of uh, knowledge-based or new economy, economy jobs. And where we've seen real strength is in uh, entrepreneurial activity, specifically looking at business starts. Uh, and our entrepreneurial activity in the city has far outpaced uh, that of similar regions and of, of the nation as a whole. And it's really prompted this narrative about you know, the city's resurgence uh, as this hotbed of technological uh, innovation. And this sort of designation of New Orleans as a new innovation hub is uh, really one of a long list of rankings and accolades the city uh, has received to sort of suggest that it was breaking with the old way and that here we had a new New Orleans. And this was a place uh, in which we see incomes rising, where we see uh, young people attracted to the city both because they see it as an interesting place to live, but they see it as a place that has job opportunities. Um, and uh, as you can see here, the brain power city. And this attraction of, of young professionals to the city is something uh, that local leaders have, have uh, definitely um, you know, promoted and been very excited about since uh, immediately after the storm. So immediately after Katrina, we had a lot of people who moved to the city, uh, young educated professionals to be a part of the rebuilding. This idea that they wanted to have jobs that matter, they wanted to take part in the rebuilding of a, a great American city. Uh, that's changed as rebuilding has shifted somewhat, but we still uh, are getting an influx of college educated professionals who are moving to New Orleans. They want to be involved with educational reform uh, or you know, they see it uh, as an interesting place where there are some job opportunities and it's less affordable or more affordable rather than uh, cities on the coast. So this is a, a very rosy picture of where we're at when we think about you know, the demographics and uh, economics, but this recovery has uh, been really uneven. We've seen that inequality has worsened in the city since 2008, and last year there was a study by Bloomberg that showed that the city of New Orleans uh, was the second worst for income inequality. Anyone know what the first was? I was sort of surprised, Miami. So we were in between Miami, New Orleans, and then Atlanta. Um, and in work that I've done, um, uh, you know, looking at, you know, we hear all this about our job recovery, incomes are going up, the, the new economy jobs that are being created, and that's true, but it's only part of the story. Uh, my colleagues and I looked at um, some really great uh, LEHD data, and we found that 60% of jobs in the region, not the city, but in the region, don't pay enough to cover uh, basic expenses. And while poverty in the city fell immediately in the years after Katrina, because poor people had a harder time coming back, um, we see that it's really inching up again. And there's a, a really startling study that came out last year that showed that in the city of New Orleans, almost 40% of the kids in the city uh, were poor and that the overwhelming majority of those kids had at least one working parent. You know, so we see people are working, but they're not making enough to, to get by. 
Um, and although our population uh, numbers have come back, you know, if we're at uh, estimated 80 to 90 percent of where we were before the storm, transit service uh, has not. And the service reductions uh, have been worse in areas where arguably transit service is most needed. Um, Low-income neighborhoods, communities of color, and uh, communities in which car ownership uh, is not common. So we can see this uh, uneven recovery. It's played out uh, spatially if we look at neighborhoods as well. Um, here we have a slide of uh, right after Katrina, or in the year after Katrina, and rather recently of an affluent uh, neighborhood in the city called Lakeview, primarily um, white, high-income community, had no problems with things like blight and vacancy before Katrina. Uh, and this neighborhood uh, has come back quite strong. Certainly not all the residents returned. Who didn't return were the elderly, right? They decided to go live with their kids somewhere else. They couldn't, you know, muster the strength to come back and rebuild. But that this uh, area was seen as a, a real attractive part of the city that you had a lot of young couples move into uh, the neighborhood. And uh, now property values in this part of town are incredibly expensive. Uh, so this area has recovered quite strong. And we can look at other neighborhoods in which uh, the recovery is much more uneven. This is uh, some images before and after of uh, a neighborhood in Gentilly. Gentilly is right next to the Lakeview neighborhood that we just looked at a picture of, very close to the lake. And this is a real interesting part of the city that was made up of racially and income diverse neighborhoods. Um, primarily homeowners before Katrina, and really not an issue with blight uh, and abandonment. And after Katrina, while certain neighborhoods have come back, um, you know, it's really spotty, and there are places where uh, we can just see these uh, vacant and abandoned lots. So we have strong neighborhoods, we've got areas that are sort of mixed and struggling, uh, and then we have lagging neighborhoods. And these are places that were. Um, you know, struggling before Katrina and uh, the devastation that the storm wrought, uh, you know, has made it uh, really difficult for these places to come back. These are um, images from not that long ago from the Lower Ninth Ward, uh, which has seen a number of residents return. There's been some public investment, but we can see, um, you know, tremendous amounts of uh, vacancy and blight. And so while this is all going on, right, we have these sort of different uh, neighborhood submarkets. we also see uh, gentrification happening. And this is something that the city is now trying to uh, grapple with. You know, I, um, because New Orleans was down for so long and people weren't really moving there, the city never really had to think about what to do if a neighborhood uh, became too strong or too popular. Uh, and now um, we're really facing displacement uh, in some of the downriver neighborhoods like the Bywater, uh, and we see prices really increasing in historic African-American neighborhoods. I'm sure you're all familiar with Treme from the HBO series, but the Seventh Ward uh, that's up there is a very historic uh, African-American neighborhood that was historically disinvested, but really interesting housing stock. Uh, these are parts of the city um, that have really uh, increased in value. And with this unevenness, right, that we can have continued disinvestment on one hand and, and gentrification on the other, you can imagine that there are very different uh, perceptions of um, recovery. There was a recent study by the Kaiser Foundation that shows a big racial gap in, in how residents are, are viewing the city. Half of the residents, uh, more than half, felt that the city had mostly recovered. But if you looked at this across racial lines, 70% uh, of whites felt that way, but only 44% of African American respondents. Um, respondents were also asked whether or not they thought New Orleans was a viable place for young people to start their careers. Uh, Two-thirds of white respondents uh, felt that it was, but yet um, only uh, one-third of African-American respondents.
So to come back to this idea of resilience, uh, is New Orleans a resilient city? As I said, uh, we've adopted this as part of our slogan. The city of New Orleans was chosen as one of 100 uh, resilient cities, which is a, a philanthropic uh, effort to increase resiliency in 100 cities uh, across the globe. Um, but I think when we talk about resilience, it's really important to look at it with a critical lens. Uh, and drawing on the work of Porter and Davuti, I think it's uh, very important to say resilience for whom and to what ends. Uh, and some scholars who have taken this, taken this critical approach to looking at resiliency, um, and I'm thinking about Susan Feinstein, I'm thinking about other work by uh, Davuti, to say, you know, we focus on how we can increase people's ability to adjust to change, but we take change for granted, right? As if uh, change is natural when it happens. Um, and as a result, in some conceptualizations of, of resilience, we don't pay enough attention to agency, right? This change isn't just happening, but in fact that there are actors and agents who are affecting how change works. And especially for planners, that's what we do, right? It's about shaping change. But yet, uh, within a lot of the planning work, it becomes this, okay, how do we adapt to it instead of uh, questioning that change? Um, and uh, in taking that real passive approach that we're overlooking the power relations that really determine uh, which places get rebuilt and how they get rebuilt. I want to talk about uh, this a little bit with some more examples. These uh, are also uh, images of the Lower Ninth Ward taken around the 10th anniversary of Katrina. Um, so we need to understand uh, agency when we think about who came back and which neighborhoods came back. New Orleans now, we're still a majority African American city, um, but uh, the share of African American residents has slipped. Uh, and residents in Katrina now, after Katrina, are wealthier and more educated. So we haven't done better by the people who live there, you know, given them more schooling, but in fact it shows uh, that wealthier people um, had an easier time coming back. Part of this was a result of the flooding. You know, as I said a moment ago, uh, talking about um, the flooding have a disproportionate, had a disproportionate impact on African American and low income communities. Uh, and that's due to these historic inequities that are built into our development patterns. Um, but it's also the direct result of our recovery policies and, ten and decisions. These policies and decisions that were made in the immediate aftermath of Katrina and continue to be made after we recovered uh, that exasperated inequities. And a couple that I'll mention uh, that I can, I can demonstrate this quite well is that immediately after Katrina, um, the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development and city officials refused to reopen uh, our public housing. Some had been flooded, but most of the public uh, housing units uh, were in decent shape. Um, so this kept tens of thousands of people <laughs> from being able to return to the city of New Orleans. Uh, after a very contentious uh, fight, uh, these uh, public housing developments were uh, taken down and redeveloped. But what this meant uh, is that if you were low income and you lived in one of these units, <laughs> you were essentially told not to come home. And in fact, even though many of these units uh, suffered no damage, it was in some cases three or four months before the residents of those housing units were even allowed back in to collect uh, you know, the things that they had left behind when they uh, evacuated from the city. A second um, decision that was made that I think gets uh, considerably less attention, but um, I think is uh, as impactful, and the decision that was made to not reopen public schools, right? Now, when we said 80% of the city uh, was flooded, this meant 80% of our um, public buildings as well, so our schools suffered a lot of damage. Um, but there were some schools that were okay and could have been um, brought online a lot quicker than they were. So in the city of New Orleans, our public schools in many cases didn't open until uh, a year after Katrina, or 
um, you know, as late as March or April after Katrina. So if you had evacuated and you had a kid in public school, you couldn't come back to New Orleans. Uh, and in New Orleans, uh, before Katrina, we had a very uh, unequal public school system. A lot of wealthy people sent their kids to a handful of selective magnet schools that surprise, they reopened. Uh, reopened in alternative places, or they sent their kids uh, to private school. So this had a real um, impact on uh, allowing people who had kids in public school the ability to come back. And when we think about uh, which neighborhoods were covered and how they recovered, we have to look at the Road Home Program, which is a federally funded uh, state initiative that provided grants to people to help them come back and rebuild. This is a multi-billion dollar initiative. The overwhelming amount of resources went to homeowners and not to renters. And in the city of New Orleans, uh, we had a majority of rental um, households, renting households before Katrina. Um, so there were very little resources between the closure of public housing, the dedication of few resources to bringing rental housing online, uh, this made it very, very difficult to come back. And people who were able to come back faced uh, rents that were uh, just um, out of control. And then for homeowners, um, the way that the homeowners were given a grant that they would use on top of their uh, insurance and their personal um, savings to help rebuild their houses. And the amount of that grant was calculated not on the cost of rebuilding, but on the pre-Katrina value of your house. So in low-income colors of community, uh, you know, where we have, um, you know, the uh, undervaluing of property, sometimes houses were worth twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. And it didn't matter how much your house was worth before Katrina hit. Wherever you lived and you were rebuilding after the storm, it cost the same amount per square foot uh, to have it rebuilt. So that there were numbers of homeowners who intended on coming back, fought to come back, came back and realized that they couldn't get it done. So I think what's really important to take away uh, here um, is just because people had the right to return, if there weren't the resources to help them do it, uh, that didn't matter too much at all. And I can't sort of surprised in talking to planning audiences uh, and sometimes the popular press who would ask me, why has this neighborhood recovered and not the other? And not this understanding of the structural inequities that low-income communities face. Uh, and, um, you know, certainly I've had a number of folks ask, looking at the Lower Ninth Ward, what could they have done, right? As if, well, they didn't really want to come back uh, enough and not acknowledging uh, the extra barriers that they faced uh, in doing so. When we think about uh, resilience and recovery, <clears throat> we also have to uh, think about the tensions or trade-offs in any planning or policy decisions, right? Isn't that what we learn about in school? Right? That we can't, although we try for consensus uh, when we're dealing with um, very politically contentious issues, it's hard to reach that consensus. Um, and you can't always produce this win-win solution. And I think that, you know, in some of the planning literature on resilience, it's this idea that here's a concept, you know, this fuzzy concept that we can all buy into, uh, we can all agree with it. Who, who doesn't think we should be resilient, right? Uh, but what do we mean by that? And, uh, you know, in fact, as I said, it doesn't account for these trade-offs that have to be made when we're allocating resources or making decisions about uh, where development can happen. What I have here, this is um, a 1.6-mile uh, line of our streetcar uh, that opened in 2013, just in time for the Super Bowl. This was a $53 million investment uh, catering uh, exclusively to tourists who come to the city. Uh, and I think that this is a good example, particularly in light of the point that I mentioned earlier on about, you know, uh, most transit service hasn't returned to these low-income communities. Um, now, let me take the 
planners and transportation and planner transportation planners in New Orleans off the hook a little bit on this one. A $53 million project, but as the transportation folks in the room will know, you know, there's a lot of federal matching funds that uh, can make this happen. And in fact, the bulk of the resources came from federal matching funds. But it still meant that some local resources were used to have this sort of streetcar to nowhere for Super Bowl fans. Um, you know, at a time when uh, people were having real difficulties uh, in getting around the city. This next image uh, here, does anyone know what this is? You guys need to read your planning magazine. This was on the cover a couple months ago. Uh, this is the Crescent City Park, which is a beautiful park. Uh, that just opened up on about a mile and a half uh, along the river, underutilized property in a hip, rapidly gentrifying neighborhood called the Bywater. And this was the brainchild of a uh, property owner and developer in the city who um, immediately after Katrina worked for um, an organization that oversaw municipal property. So this was underutilized municipal property. He said, hey, I've got this great idea, called it Reinventing the Crescent, brought in uh, you know, world-class architects and, and uh, landscape architects from across the country to think about how we could uh, re-envision and create this uh, really wonderful space. And it's a beautiful park, and if you come to New Orleans, I really suggest going there. Um, my issue with it is that they used $30 million of disaster CDBG money to build this park. And this was an issue that aside from one, one newspaper article that said gentrification or good for all, that this was not even uh, discussed or debated in the public realm. And to give you guys a little bit of a background, uh, when a community is hit by a disaster, you can get money from FEMA to help you uh, rebuild infrastructure and public facilities. And uh, then the federal government has used the Community Development Block Grant Program to funnel money to disaster uh, struck communities. And these monies are supposed to be used, uh, you know, originally the true purpose was to help low and moderate income families and households, but those impacted by the community. City of New Orleans, we got $411 million of disaster CDBG. $30 million uh, went to this park beautiful park, but in a neighborhood uh, that saw little, if any, uh, damage from the storm. And as I've said, this made the cover of Planning Magazine for their special issue on resilience. Uh, so I think here again we have to ask resilience for who? Uh, and I will say that the individual who spearheaded this owns a lot of property in this neighborhood and has since uh, the park has opened uh, developed um, and just got permission to develop a high-rise residential department, a, a residential development right on the park. Uh, and if anything, this is making it more difficult for low and moderate income people uh, living in this neighborhood because it's really uh, accelerating the development pressures and fueling gentrification. Oops, sorry. Here uh, is an image of a young girl crawling up a bridge. This is referred to as the Rusty Rainbow, and this is a bridge uh, that goes into the Crescent City Park. And it says, we are an equitable city. As I mentioned, the city of New Orleans was chosen as one of the 100 resilient cities, and as part of that, uh, we've come up with a resilient New Orleans plan. Uh, maybe a little bit hard to see, but really thinking about how to re-envision the city and come up with an action plan in three areas that will strengthen our resilience. One dealing with uh, the challenging environment that we face, uh, another one dealing with equity, uh, you know, largely addressing some of those points that I mentioned about lack of access to good jobs uh, and increasing uh, inequities. Um, but here, for their page on an equitable city, they have uh, a picture of this park, which, you know, ironically got a lot of public money that could have been used for affordable housing and could have been used for workforce development, uh, but was done here. So the point is to um, 
you know, when we're talking about resilience, not to, you know, not to uh, think that we can only have a win-win solution, sol win-win solution, but that we need to acknowledge that there are these tensions and, and trade-offs and embrace them, right? And say, hey, uh, you know, how uh, can we as a community, um, you know, move forward and make a choice? I don't know if you can read that if it's a little blurry, but this I thought uh, was really interesting, and this was a flyers that first emerged after the Gulf oil spill uh, and then came back in full force um, for the 10th anniversary of Katrina. And the flyer here was posted by an organization <laughs> called the Louisiana Justice Institute, uh, which is an organization that fights for racial and social, and, uh, social equity uh, in uh, the state. And this was put up to really challenge the feel-good rhetoric about New Orleans, we're back, we're resilient. Uh, and the woman who put this up, Tracy Washington, if I could read a, a quote that I thought really gets at what I'm trying to convey here. She says, you are forced to be resilient when you are placed in an environment that is unnatural with man-made suffering. Where another actor can alleviate this condition that is forcing you to be resilient to it. I don't want to be resilient. I think we should fix things that are making us resilient, making us to be resilient. Um, so I want to conclude by providing a hopeful example, right? Uh, you know, not have this uh, be such a, a depressing presentation. But one example of uh, an effort in post-Katrina New Orleans that has uh, really, I think, um, helped create more resilient neighborhoods. It's helped vulnerable people come back to New Orleans. Uh, it's helped them come back and uh, live in safe, uh, environmentally sound <laughs> housing structures. And it's also tried to uh, create more sustainable, dense neighborhoods to recreate vitality in these uh, neighborhoods that we're facing uh, a lot of vacancies. And this is a, an initiative called Project Home Again. Uh, and this was started after Katrina by the Riggio Foundation, which was um, founded by Len Riggio, who is the uh, CEO of Barnes & Noble. Apparently he has some New Orleans connection. His wife's family was from there, big lover of New Orleans culture, but also a lifelong civil rights advocate. Uh, and in the aftermath of Katrina, he was really concerned about uh, low and, and moderate income people being able to come back. And he said, I want to do something that can help. I want to help make people whole again. So this initiative that was created, uh, and it was really innovative. It was a home building and land swap program. So if you were a lower moderate income homeowner, uh, you could participate in this program. And what you did is you gave the um, project home again your property, with or without the damaged unit on it. In exchange, they gave you a modest uh, but storm-resistant uh, two to three bedroom home that had a forgivable mortgage on it. And I want to stress like, what a burden it became for people who had to deal with their damaged properties. So they did this for 101 households. Almost all of those households had planned on coming back to rebuild. They came back to New Orleans to rebuild and couldn't get it done. Right? They didn't have the resources, fell ill, you know, some other family tragedy. Uh, and having to maintain and insure and pay the mortgage, right, potentially on uh, these abandoned units uh, became a real stress. So what they did is not only helped 101 families live in more sustainable dwellings, but what they did is they worked with the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority. So when they got a property, they went to the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority and said, let's swap this for a property in one of our neighborhoods that we're focusing on. So they targeted neighborhoods that they saw were coming back. Uh, and they leveraged other public and private investment. These were neighborhoods in which there were public schools that were being built, in which uh, maybe there were some affluent neighborhoods that were coming back to say, hey, not only are we gonna get people a house back, but we're gonna have them in a neighborhood uh, 
uh, that's going to be a, a vital and viable neighborhood. Uh, and so they were able to do what the city officials weren't, right? How to allow people to come back, but channel it uh, in a way that would make the people resilient uh, and the city of New Orleans more resilient. So just in closing, um, you know, a few lessons or takeaways to reiterate uh, from New Orleans uh, is that participation is essential, but it's not enough. And if there are the financial resources to help people come back, uh, it's an empty promise. And so we can look at the Lower Ninth Ward and it's not because these people didn't want to come back or they're not resilient uh, or they didn't work hard enough, but that they face uh, barriers that residents from wealthier neighborhoods didn't face. Second, when we think, we, we can't, uh, in thinking about resilience and thinking about recovery, overlook uh, agency. That the change that happens, while it may be inevitable, it's not natural. And that there are actors uh, and agents that are affecting change. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that and try to understand those power relations. And finally, um, that there are trade-offs, that not every program or project is going to be this win-win situation. Uh, and we have to identify and acknowledge those trade-offs and say which uh, values do we uh, hold on to as a community, and those are the ones that we should work forward in our projects. So in closing, just in thinking of resilience, resiliency for whom and to what ends, and like Tracy Washington says, ideally, why do we have to be resilient? Why don't we fix the things that are causing us to be resilient? Thank you. I talked a little bit longer than I wanted to. Someone should have given me a, a hand or a sign. <laughs> We open the call for questions from the audience. Anybody with a question? First, I guess. Uh, let me ask you a question because I want to compare you to the Uh huh. Yeah, very good. There it is. Can I compare you to Detroit for a moment? Sure. Yeah, that's all. Um, Not there, Maine, at New Orleans. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, that's right. Your presentation, <laughs> Detroit. Um, there's a reality of vacancy, and there's a perception of abandonment. I want you to think about those two. And in New Orleans' case, uh, people had to leave because it was life-threatening. Uh, they went to Houston, by and large and uh, they couldn't come back. That was your presentation. Since 67, Detroit has lost uh, its middle class population. It's made those neighborhoods that it abandoned harder for those that stayed. In fact, Detroit has a policy of moving people from what it calls unviable neighborhoods into those that remain viable, the few that remain viable in the city. Um, in New Orleans' case, as bizarre as this question may be, could it have been ameliorated or stopped had people simply remained and took a stand on their homes? Or was that out of the question? Well, but I think people did take a stand and, and in, in a way, that's why the city backtracked and, and said, hey, we're not going to think about any reconfiguring, we're just going to allow people to come back. And so people took a stand, and then people realized, wow, I can take a stand, and I may be able to influence the decision to allow us yes. to come back. But if we don't have the resources to get it done, um, you know, that's a, a whole other situation altogether. My husband teaches in the Lower Ninth Ward. He's taught that for many years, and uh, I've gotten to know some of the parents and his colleagues uh, who currently live there or used to live there. And I remember, this is totally anecdotal, and I try not to do this too much, but I think that this story is particularly moving. We were at a birthday party for one of his students, and I start talking to the grandmother. It's probably six years after Katrina, and she said, oh, I got back into my house. And I'm like, congratulations. So six years, okay? 
that she works uh, moderate income African American six years of her life to work to slave to get back into her neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I said, how is it? And she says, I'm the only house for five blocks. And my heart sunk. I didn't know what to say. And then she said, oh, but I'd like it better that way. It's quiet. You know, so it's this whole rationalization. So part of me thinks, mm -hmm. well, I'm very happy that this woman was able to come back and that's what she wanted to do. When she decided she wanted to come back in September of 2005, you know, what people thought they were coming back to was the neighborhood and the social networks that were there. And, uh, you know, people have come back and uh, some of these neighborhoods aren't viable. And they took a stand and these were the ones who had the wherewithal to get it done. And, and uh, you know, is this, is this the best we could do is my question. And I would say to Detroit, I know that they have tried to come up with policies to move people from unviable to viable neighborhoods but it's really difficult to do. And uh, this is where, and maybe I'm being a little too aspirational, but I think planning needs to think about, you know, offering these alternatives and offering these solutions. So if you tell someone in an unviable neighborhood in Detroit, mm -hmm. you've got to get out, well, unless that there's a real option of where they can go, they're going to say, no, you're taking my land away. That's all I have. And oh, you're going to buy me out and my house is worth $20,000? That's not going to get me a house anywhere else. So the Project Home Again example was, uh, on a small scale, able to do that. Now what detractors say is Len Riggio, real generous guy, $22 million. That's why it happened. Yeah, but we spent $30 million on a beautiful park. <laughs> right? So, I mean, I know resources are limited, but I mean, I think we need to, as planners, sort of kind of create options for people and really viable options. So, okay, you can come back and really rebuild, and rebuild in a place that maybe it's not going to be exactly like it was, but a place that you want to be. And you're not going to be a 60, 70 year old woman living by yourself in a place without street lights and there's no one around. But the policy here is one of shrinking. Detroit is shrinking and New Orleans has shrunk and, and might shrunk even f further. Uh, the, the policy in Detroit is to shrink uh, another 100,000. They haven't shrunk enough. And then they'll become stable. And perhaps from there they can become more viable. I'm, I'm saying the policy of resilience is one of shrinkage. Yeah, but, but here, even in shrinkage, right, that how as planners that we've approached it without giving people an alternative, they get shrunk. <laughs> and then what do you do, right? So this is saying, and, and I have a couple of colleagues at Wayne State and I've talked at length about this and they're like, wow, if you could do something like that and you could get, you know, do a development that cater to like single elderly women or that you could you could pick off some neighborhoods in Detroit and say, hey, come here, right? Mm -hmm. And that that would be, uh, you know, a viable alternative. But in the absence of that alternative, of course, people are going to say no, right? Because that's all they have. I don't okay. know if that got at your question. Um, so, I guess just to clarify, are you saying that um, the city doesn't have the resources it needs to rebuild or that it does and it's just spending its resources on like, uh, like gentrification and things that aren't really important? Well, I mean, there's never enough resources. Um, but that, uh, you know, my point is that, you know, there are trade-offs. So if we do one thing, it means that we're not doing something else and we need to acknowledge that. Um, and, uh, you know, if we think about, wow, this park is beautiful, it's resilient, no person in their right mind would go to, the, go to that park and say, wow, this is, this is fabulous. But if we think about, okay, this was, these were resources that were dedicated to helping vulnerable populations and neighborhoods come back, then you have to say, hey, is this really uh, the proper use of those resources? But that isn't, um, I apologize. That isn't even part of the discussion, right? Um, but but I will I will back up and say it isn't just the city of New Orleans, um, you know that there are definitely resources that the city had at its control, but it goes higher up too. 
and we look at how all the recovery funding is structured, whether it be at the federal level or at the state level, um, but that we need to take a hard look at it and say, you know, what worked, what didn't, how do we make sure it doesn't happen like this next time? I just have an adjunct on that question um, or a follow-up. Uh, so you talk about agency when it comes to people returning to the city and trying to get back into their homes. What kind of agency promotes po the, promoted the policies that were inequitable? It, it, when, when Katrina hit, there was a lot of discussion in sort of national politics about this issue that you talk about of it being a, a clean slate for things like policy experimentation. And I'm, I'm wondering if why is, why was it that the disposition of the, the, the recovery was towards intensifying inequality? Where where is the agency there? Who who are the mm -hmm. who are the agents that are behind uh, this intensified uh, mm -hmm. inequality? You're talking about the issue of how city resources are spent. Mm -hmm. And that's a good question. And I think that uh, you know in some cases. Uh, and maybe the park example that we had, you know, someone who was advocating for it who uh, was an agent who stood to directly gain, but he was also, I think, committed to the idea of the park. But I think that if we don't talk about the fact that there are actors and institutions that are structuring this, then we just think it's passive and that it's natural. And the people who structure the road home money do I think that they were trying to necessarily penalize people in low-income communities? No, but it wasn't natural, right, that people there had a harder time. Uh, so that we have to really understand and say, hey, wait a second, you know, we need to understand what these sort of ramifications are and make the case for uh, compensating people on the, the basis of housing costs and not housing value. Right, that that seems actually pretty simple, right? Housing value, a poor neighborhood. In the Lower Ninth Ward, this, this neighborhood had uh, one of the highest levels of home ownership in the city, higher than the, the city as a whole. And we're talking about like intergenerational home ownership. But what that meant, oftentimes these households didn't have clear title, which you needed to participate in the recovery program. And it had been passed down, and a home might be owned by 12 grandkids. But the house hadn't been reassessed for years, so really the, the houses were worthless. So this may have been an oversight in the people in Baton Rouge uh, who were creating it. I don't think that they were really intending to harm people, but it did have that effect. And we need to understand that and try to make sense of, oh gee, why this area recover? Does that kind of answer your question? But then also I think that there are, uh, certainly I do economic development work. I don't think all developers and all business people have nefarious goals, but developers and corporations know what they need. They know what they need. When you work in the public sector, you're dealing with multiple goals and you're constantly trying to figure out what to do. When a situation like this happens, that developer, that corporation can say, I need A, B, and C, right? Uh, you know, so that they definitely have an advantage over, you know, public sector actors. But we need to be cognizant of that. To be clear, there aren't very many recovery resources left. Uh, and I will say, the, uh, for clarification, the park project was later on, and it was disaster CDBG money, so it was up to the city's discretion on how to allocate it, but the city council had to vote on it. And to this day, I'm not really certain how that sort of squeezed by without it being uh, getting more 
public attention. Um, people were back in New Orleans, so they weren't able to participate in that Bring New Orleans Back planning process. There were two subsequent planning processes, uh, one of which had a neighborhood component that really tried to galvanize and get people involved. And I don't want to uh, in any way downplay the great work by residents and community groups that really had a, you know, in many respects, positive impact on how um, you know, the city recovered in, in shaping that agenda. But to be clear, you know, the, having a participatory process doesn't mean uh, that we're gonna have these uh, outcomes that are necessarily gonna benefit those people. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you for a very good talk. I mean, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great talk. Uh, it's a great talk uh, uh, in a long time in some ways. Uh, I am very happy that, that, you, uh, that you moved on from, say, the outsider's view. Like I've been in ma after many, many uh, disasters in many places, like in Gujarat and China and all these places. Uh, planners, uh, mayors, everybody come and say, you know, like, as you said, we have a great opportunity to replan this or rebuild this and, 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 and so on and so on. And most of the time what we don't hear is kind of like, did you ever ask the people what they want to do with this now? I mean, it's totally missing, you know, in, in, in almost all, all of this. Uh, so it's, it's great to hear uh, about agency. I have a small question about agency, you know, like, uh, of the people. In uh, in New Orleans, I mean, I saw, like, the, say, the Vietnamese community ha had probably, like, a, I don't know, the most agency or whatever, because they, you know, they were taken out of the place, you know, before the hurricane. They came back. They fought against kind of like uh, dumping uh, the mm -hmm. waste uh, and, and so on. Uh, so, uh, in some ways, I, I was just wondering. I mean, you mentioned a couple of neighborhoods, you know, like why some of these neighborhoods like this are not mentioned. And also, I mean, I saw that, uh, that, that planning meeting where, you know, like, I mean, you mm -hmm. said the, the uh, majority are African-Americans. I mean, I saw a few African-Americans there. I mean, mm -hmm. s seems like somebody else is making plans for other people, you know, in mm -hmm. some ways. Uh, uh, I'm wondering why didn't I hear people at that scale? Is it because you're taking larger concepts like populations and neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there's a lot to try to squeeze into the talk. Uh, and, um, you know, certainly you were pointing out of the Vietnamese community is an important one, and this is a community uh, that's gotten a lot of attention and there's a lot written about, you know, their resilience and their ability to uh, shape you know, how their recovery went. Um, and, and really, that wasn't the story that I wanted to tell. And I mean, I think that there are plenty of examples, and that's why in no way would I want to discount that participation. But at the same time, you know, that participation, whether or not it's effective, uh, is mediated by many things. In the Vietnamese community, very tight-knit tight -knit, tight -knit community, I don't, I haven't heard much about the sort of resource constraints that they faced. They worked really closely with their church. The community worked well together, and that you know undoubtedly uh, enabled them to uh, come back. Um, you know, and my uh, focus was you know sort of looking at the two extremes. You know, the uh, the well-to-do community that was able to uh, come back pretty easily, and then the lower-income community. And uh, with that community and also the African-American community in the East, um, you know, this sort of idea of like, well, what went wrong? Why didn't it work, right, without an understanding of, um, you know, the barriers that these, these communities faced. And I think that, you know, the Vietnamese community is an excellent one to look at, uh, you know, those elements uh, that really came together and made them be successful. And that they had, you know, they were able to, uh, through their church, um, you know, gained some political power and political clout. And uh, as you said, you talked about the dump, um, really uh, forced some pretty important decisions there. Really interesting, actually, that uh, now there's a whole, not a whole network, but there's a number of younger Vietnamese activists in uh, New Orleans who are working around housing and community development issues. And I've interviewed and, and know some of them quite well. And uh, one of them said, you know, 
before Katrina, you know, you know, we didn't know what a CDC was. The uh, priest of the church, uh, that's the big galvanizing entity in the neighborhood, thought it was the Centers for Disease Control. <laughs> and, you know, a national Vietnamese organization said, no, come in, come on, let's do this. Uh, and some of the young people who became uh, the key community organizers talked about like having a real difficult time selling this as a career path to their parents, right? Their parents wanted them to, you know, go into STEM or sort of like, what is this community activism? But then seeing, you know, what their children were able to do, uh, you know, getting a health clinic there uh, really has just, I think, increased the voice of that community tremendously. Uh, you know, in New Orleans. So, you know, before Katrina, there weren't Vietnamese interpreters at, you know, city council events or things like that. And I think that that's changed quite a bit and that's a positive development.